welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. Y'all, I have waited years for this interview, and finally, I got it. I have two fabulous guests for you today. Raymond Moody, MD, PhD, is the leading authority on the near-death experience, a phrase he coined and an experience he defined in the late 70s. His seminal work, Life After Life, completely changed the way we view death and dying and has sold more than 13 million copies worldwide. The New York Times calls Dr. Moody the father of the near-death experience. For more than five decades, Dr. Moody has regularly enlightened audiences with his lectures and public speaking events. His Life After Life Institute provides a place for leading-edge researchers and thinkers to share their investigations into near-death phenomena and offers online courses and personal consultations. Dr. Moody is also in the private practice of philosophical counseling and consulting on dying, training hospice workers, clergy, psychologists, nurses, doctors, and other medical professionals on matters of grief, recovery, and dying. Dr. Moody received his medical degree from the College of Georgia and his Ph.D. in philosophy from the University of Virginia, where he also received his M.A. and B.A. He is the recipient of many awards, including the World Humanitarian Award and a bronze medal in the Human Relations category of the New York Film Festival for the movie version of Life After Life. Dr. Moody is a frequent media guest and has appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show three times, as well as on hundreds of other local and nationally syndicated programs such as Today, ABC's Turning Point, and MSNBC Grief Recovery. Paul Perry is the co-author of five New York Times bestsellers, including The Light Beyond with Raymond Moody, Saved by the Light with Daniel Brinkley, and Evidence of the Afterlife with Jeffrey Long, M.D., Perry has co-written a dozen books on near-death experiences, six of them with Dr. Moody. His books have been published in more than 30 languages around the world. Paul is also a documentary filmmaker whose work has appeared on worldwide television. His best-known film, Jesus, The Lost Years, a documentary based on his book Jesus in Egypt, has aired more than 20 times in the United States. His most recent film, The Secrets and Mysteries of Christopher Columbus, has been viewed nearly four million times on the British history streaming channel, Timeline of History. For his film and book about artist Salvador Dali, Paul was knighted in Portugal and is the official filmmaker of the Portuguese royal family. Paul is a graduate of Arizona State University and Antioch University in Los Angeles, as well as a former fellow at the prestigious Gannett Center for Media Studies at Columbia University in New York City, where he studied public health. He taught magazine writing at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, and was executive editor of American Health Magazine, a winner of the National Magazine Awards for General Excellence. Since becoming a full-time writer, Paul has written or co-written more than 20 books on a variety of topics, including biography, health, medical science, and history. Dr. Raymond Moody and Paul Perry have co-authored a brand new book called Proof of Life After Life, Seven Reasons to Believe There is an Afterlife. Here's a brief description, and then pour your tea and enjoy the conversation. After spending nearly five decades studying near-death experiences, Dr. Raymond Moody finally has the answer to humanity's most pressing question, what happens when we die? In proof of life after life, Moody and co-author Paul Perry 
reveal that consciousness survives after the death of the body. Featuring in-depth case studies, the latest research, and eye-opening interviews with experts, Proof explores everything from common paranormal signs to shared death experiences and much more. You can learn more about both of these authors along with Dr. Moody's other great work at lifeafterlife.com. First, I want to welcome Dr. Raymond Moody to the parlor. And sir, we've been talking, but I have been wanting to interview you for years. And it is such an honor to finally get the opportunity to do that. So welcome. Patrick, thank you so much. And I'm sorry about those years. I tell you, at the prison, they are a little strict about interviews. but (laughs) No, no, I just thank you so much, man. And also to the folks listening in, thank you so much really to, you know, because I am so enthusiastic about this subject even after 50 plus years. So thank you, everybody, so much for your interest. And it shows. And I also want to welcome Paul Perry. You have co-authored six books now with Dr. Moody, and I've read most of them. So I'm assuming you all have a great friendship. And just sitting here before we record, that is coming out, too. So I'm curious, how far does this collaboration go back and how did it come about? It goes back 33 years. And I was uh, editing a magazine in New York. New York City, a magazine called American Health Magazine. And I was uh, asked by, we have a mutual agent, book agent, but we'd never met each other. And uh, he said, hey, would you like to write a book with uh, Dr. Raymond Moody? And I said, I don't even know who Dr. Moody is. And, and he said, well, he's the guy who named and defined the near-death experience. I don't know what a near-death experience is. And he said, well, for the editor of a big health magazine, uh, you're pretty poorly educated. <laughs> so he insisted that I go work on a book with Raymond, a book that is called The Light Beyond. And it dealt with the research that was done after Life After Life. And uh, I wrote this book, and I just got hooked on the subject. You know, it's an easy subject to fall in love with, because what the big three questions in life are, where did we come from? Why are we here? And where do we go when we die? And uh, the one that everyone's concerned about is where do we go when we die? And so working with Dr. Moody has kind of forced you to think about things and, and, you know, surround yourself in this world, huh? (laughs) Well, he's such a, he's such an amazing teacher. And within the, the first few days of Working with him, I just, I just thought, I really want to milk this guy for the, all the information that he has about life and, and death. See, and it goes both ways, because I mean, Paul comes from the fine arts community, you know, and a master of fine arts, and then journalism. And, and you know, it's interesting, see, I noticed from the very beginning of our friendship that um, I, being a philosophy professor and a, a psychiatrist, I ask a certain set of questions, but Paul, he asks a very different set of questions. (laughs) And I think it's so interesting that it gives us, and of course, you know, as soon as somebody asks me a question, I go back to what Plato said about it and what the Aristotle's third rule of thought is, and and people don't want to hear that. <laughs> and I understand. And so Paul helps me modulate this fascinating information to get across to people what you know what they can sort of take in about. It's like that old saying in music, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Oh, I am there. I am there. I don't want to hear 16 minute verses. Give me chorus, chorus, and bridge, and make me cry, and finale. <laughs> there you go. He hasn't made me cry yet, but that's <laughs> And Patrick, you being a musician, you might really be interested in one of the things that we have in this new book. Oh, uh, yeah. Proof of Life After Life, and I mean that title sincerely. 
But one thing that we talk about in there are cases of um, musical deaths, if I can put it that way. People who, as far as their family n uh, knew, had no interest in music or poetry while they were living, that sort of suddenly or unaccountably in the days before, hours for as they are dying, sort of burst into song or who recite poetry or in, in the last days um, write poetry. And I learned about this when I was 18 years old, reading Plato's Phaedo, which is about the death of Socrates. And his friends are surprised that day he's going to be executed, that he's been writing songs. He used to, oh, that's trivial songs, he said, but now he's you know, fancying himself a songwriter. But And he was writing songs just on the days before he was dying. And then, you know, 12 years later, I guess it was, at a medical, as a medical student in my surgery rotation, I saw it with my own eyes. This lady, elderly lady, as she was dying, was reciting poetry. I didn't, you know, I couldn't. What was that again? You know, I was trying to resuscitate. But you know, I, the rhyme and the meter you picked up. And so now I find, you know, I mean, it's it's not very well known, but there's lots of folks who have these amazing musical deaths. One of the stories that you told about in the book, uh, and I don't remember if it came from other researchers or if it was one of one that you covered, but a woman who had been plagued with some you know, mental disabilities, who was mute right. and never really kind of had a life like you and I and everyone else and on the deathbed suddenly started singing songs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was an amazing story. It has a whole part to the story that I haven't really talked about before, Raymond, but it's it's in the book a little bit. But she, her name was Catherine Emmer. And uh, she had had meningitis from uh, as, at a very early age, like three or four. And from that date on, she never spoke. She really didn't communicate with anybody. She was institutionalized until I think she was in her, had to be in her 30s maybe. And then she started to go into her dying process. And uh, everyone at the institution loved her, and, and uh, they came around to see her before she was dying, but all of a sudden, she starts singing a song, uh, and the song dealt with the soul. Where does the soul go when we die? And she's singing this, doctors are coming in. I got it from uh, two doctors took very good notes, and I got it from their notes. She was in Germany, and when she finally died, one of the doctors who was a member of the National Socialist Party, not yet the Nazi Party, went to a meeting, one of his meetings one night, and they started talking about euthanizing people who, had, uh, who were in the institution because they felt it was a, you know, a waste of public resources. And he stood up and against the National Socialist Party, he told the story and he said, this proves to me that people who are incapacitated by mental illness or disease still have personhood. And therefore, they're still living people. They're just living somewhere else. They're living with inside, inside their head. And that, for years, took them off of the subject of, of euthanasia, of the mentally ill. Of course, I don't think it ultimately did. I think they did euthanize people. But uh, he was brave to stand up and talk about it. That story would give anybody goosebumps on multiple levels. I mean, <laughs> that's um, unbelievable. Yeah. Two people in my own association network, and I'm not a social type person, but two people I know. Um, one uh, was a woman I had known for, I guess, 30 years, who as she was dying, I was not there, but her everybody was there said that as she was dying, she started singing, sang herself out. And uh, then the other was my friend, Jimmy. Yeah, I didn't know his brother, but I knew Jimmy well. And Jimmy was there when his brother died and again started singing like this. So what I'm getting at is if, if I, with a fairly limited social network, have two people, that, you know, it's got to be more common than is acknowledged, I think. I have quite a few questions about 
the topic of shared death experiences, which is really what is covered in this book. But before we get into that, I have just a few general NDE questions, if that's okay. And (laughs) I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this first question, and it might be a weird one to start with. But here goes, because I have absolutely horrible eyesight. I make jokes about people seeing crisis apparitions at the foot of their beds and how there would be no point in trying to pull that off with me, because if you I I wouldn't see it, it would be a blur, more blurry than possibly it already is. And also, if you wake me up, I also can't hear you because I've got my noisy CPAP machine attached to my face. So if I were to have an NDE based on your research, am I likely to experience it in blurry vision? And and what about some of the other senses? Do, do people have to worry about that? You know, I incredibly, Patrick, I've, let me just tell you a personal story that happened. All right, this book, Life After Life was published in 1975, okay? Then in 70, it was quickly a bestseller. I think in 77 or late 76, I was invited up to Long Island to a, an Episcopal church, but it was the program was sponsored by a hospital. And so, but they had it at this Episcopal church, and so... The guy who introduced me was a very venerable surgeon who was well-known in the community. And so about six weeks before knowing that it was coming, they had given him my book to review. And to, and he said that, and he told the audience, he said, I, I read this book and I've never heard of this. I've resuscitated a lot of people. But he said, just like shortly thereafter, He resuscitated this woman who had been blind since she was 18. And she was elderly at that time. And he said, sort of in a, you know, a joking manner, he said to us, he said, you didn't have one of those funny experiences, did you? Like in that attitude. And she said, well, if I did, doctor, I wouldn't tell you about it. (laughs) (laughs) Then once they, you know, got the ice was broken, she said, yeah. And she said she was out of her body looking down, but she said it was the high, it was not just regular vision. He told me later, he said it was hypervision. And that's what people say. It's that people say you see colors that you, that don't exist in the regular spectrum here. I've heard people describe telescopic vision. They say you, it's like you just look at something across the room and zoom, you're there. Also, they say it's only analogously that you can talk about it as earth vision. See, I mean, it's just like, that's the best term you have for what it is. Yeah. And they often speak of it as being uh, just psychic communication. That, uh, you know, they can have their eyes closed and they're still picking it up. We've, I've spoken to, to people who are blind and had near-death experiences. And it's the same thing Raymond said. They would leave their body. They could describe an accident scene very well. And it's the only eyesight they'd ever had. It's the only time they'd ever seen color, the only time they'd ever seen the world around them. It's very frustrating to some people, by the way, because they'll see colors, but they can't describe the colors. And they'll obsess by by trying to recreate the colors, mixing paints or mixing crayons, things like that. Yeah. And that's fairly common, right, Raymond? It is. And and another one that you might be interested in, Patrick, which is relevant to this, is that I was 1985 or 86, I think. I was in New York City for the American American Psychological Association meeting that day. And there was a young clinical psychologist in his 30s who was from upstate New York somewhere. And his research was that he had interviewed 17, I think it was, people who had near-death experiences and they had heard the music and reported as part of this and um, had heard the music, as we ourselves report in Proof of Life After Life, just published by 
Simon and Schuster. Just kidding. And and so <laughs> and so um he was a musicologist in addition to being a clinical psychologist. And so he would the way he proceeded was he would ask each one was the mu everybody said it was indescribable. He said, but the way he would do it, he would say he would play them a little quick piece of Mozart, or then, I mean, this piece of Brahm, or, you know, I don't know. I, I stopped with Gene Autry and, <laughs> you know, but, you know, what are the big names and all. And so, but he would say, then he would say, is it close, is what you heard closer to this or to this? And it was a very interesting study, but he said, you know, the limitation, as they say, even at the best of it, is that it's still beyond their ability to put it into words. And you might have heard of the wonderful um, Dr. Anthony Chicoria, who we talk about in, in uh, Proof of Life After Life, just published by Simon Schuster, in which this, uh, this Anthony Chicoria, who is just a dear man, you would love him, I mean, he's... All right, Anthony is a PhD in physiology, okay, and an MD, and he is a orthopedic surgeon and a professor of orthopedic surgery at NYU, and never had any interest whatsoever in music, who was, in 1994, struck in the neck by a bolt of lightning and had a cardiac arrest. And fortunately, a, a nurse who was in the payphone line that was antique times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so she was right there to resuscitate him. But uh, he said that during his, you know, he was out of his body going all through around this reunion center where his his family was having a, a you know, a family reunion. He was able to see what, you know, say, describe what they were doing. And he said he was in this place that was more real than real, he said. And then coming back from this, unaccountably, he suddenly developed an interest in the piano and started here having this recurrent dream in which he was playing a piano on a concert stage. And he was playing the same piece, so he learned how to transcribe music so he could write down this piece and started learning the piano. And now, in addition to a, would I surrender my foot as an addicted walker? To Anthony Chikori, I say. I mean, to me, the idea of having a foot injury is literally a horror, Patrick. I mean, I am, it's not a virtue, it's an addiction, as Paul will testify to movement. Every day, I gotta do it, not virtue, I gotta do it, right? No, if I even hate to think about the thought, but if I was to hurt my foot, would I go to, yes, I would go to, to, Anthony Chikoria and, you know, said, please help me. And so in this friend of mine, he says, yeah, this was realer than real. And so in the worldview that most people accept, we all have got to agree that that story just does not fit with consensual reality mm -hmm. as, as most people perceive it, <laughs> right? That is out of the framework. And to me, it boils down to the issue, do I think, people ask me, have always asked me since I started studying this 50 years ago, Dr. Moody, is there proof? Can you prove this? And, all? and I, you know, I'm, I was a professor of logic. I understand the intricacies of what proof means and all. It's a difficult concept. But, you know, I've quickly found that people weren't going to respond to me talking about Girdle's proof or, you know, C.I. Lewis's argument. I mean, you know, what they want to hear is something. And what I finally figured that point they want to hear is, Dr. Moody, can you give me some sort of, can I, can I be confident on the basis of some sort of rational process that there is an afterlife? And I can say, yeah. It's because not because I have any sort of religious commitment to it or believe it. I just give up. See, to me, I can't. All the stuff about oxygen deprivation to the brain, that's hooey. Because it's I knew from one of my own medical school professors, my first year in medical school, that she had the same experience, but she wasn't having a cardiac arrest herself. She was trying to resuscitate her mother unsuccessfully.
So as her mother was dying, she herself left her body, saw from above, saw her mother there in spirit form, saw her mother recede away into this light coming from a tunnel, saw relatives and friends of her mother's who had died coming out to meet her mother, then herself, the doctor, back into her body. You know, that's not oxygen deprivation to her brain. And, and it's very common. I mean, a lot of people listening to this will say, yeah, that happened to me. But it's a hard thing to put together and to, you know, even I can say, yeah, I give up. I, I can't think my way out of this. You know, back to the music for a minute, if we can. Yeah. Uh, fairly frequently, people hear music at the deathbed. And we have several cases that uh, uh, we have cases from the 19th century because we tried to cover all of history in this book with different cases. And uh, in the 19th century, there's several cases of people hearing music, sometimes in the room as a person is, is dying, or in another part of the house. And there may be five or six who are standing around the bed, and only three or four will hear it. And some don't hear the music. And I've found, because I've done research in other areas, that the same is true with people who uh, are witnessing visions. In Egypt, I was uh, working on a story on visions that took place in 1968 at a church in a place called Zaitun, which is outside of Cairo. And thousands of people showed up. There were, there were visions of uh, Virgin Mary for months, and they would appear two or three times a week. People would stand there and wait and wait and wait. And some would see her and some wouldn't. And then the ones who saw, saw her were saw her very clearly. And it's the same thing with, with the music, too. And I, I had never really quite been able to figure that out, is why so many people could see or hear something so clearly and other people can't. And to the vision again, uh, I was talking to a theologian from Harvard, actually, who, who taught at the American University in Cairo. And he said he would take his friends over to see this vision. It was like it was occurring frequently, like almost daily. And very religious people could not see it. And he said then the atheists in the group could see it just fine. So it's, a, it's like a mystery. It's one of these mysteries of, of paranormal events like this that crosses many boundaries. Yeah. Well, it's just so common. The older you get, the more, the greater percentage of the people your age have had some sort of experience in their life of stepping over to the other side. In a few minutes, I'll share a friend of mine from growing up has shared with me some experiences. But this book mainly focuses on the lesser known concept of shared death experiences or SDEs as opposed to, you know, near death experiences. And you detail the seven types of shared death experiences, which you also say are the seven reasons to believe in life after life. How far back? Have you been hearing stories of shared death experiences? And I guess maybe we need to talk about what they are specifically. Well, for me, it was, um, I got into this through Plato, to tell you the truth, when I was 18. I read about it in the Republic. Three years later, I heard it from a living person, Dr. George Ritchie, then throughout for, and also, as an undergraduate, heard more. So, philosophy professor heard more from students and colleagues. It accumulated like that. And when I went to medical school in 1972, I was already known for this research. The faculty knew this student was coming who had been a philosophy professor who had studied this. And so, very quickly, within the last, first couple of weeks I was in medical school, Eight of my professors reached out to me, about half of them saying, yeah, I've heard this from my patients. I'm glad you're studying. Others said, yeah, I've heard I had this myself. And so that was. And so one of the people who approached me, this was a little later, but she she was told me that she had this experience when she was resuscitating her mother. And the fact that she was not ill or injured herself shows she it was not oxygen deprivation to her brain. But subsequently, we've just recumulated a lot of them. And it's um, what people say is it, 
you know, not everybody has all aspects of it, right? But what people say is, for example, as grandma died, I myself got out of my body. I started going upward toward this light with her. Then, and often it's like I saw the, her relatives and friends coming together. Then I myself came back to my body. Or people say that the room changes geometry, Patrick. I mean, it's just, and I, that happened to me too. And I mean, I, when I, it's, after I'd been studying this some time, I'll talk about it later, but I, I myself had this experience with my mother. And in my case, it was uh, like you could, it's like you're not in a three dimensional hospital room anymore. You're in some other. It's like a double inverted funnel. I mean, you, it, you can't describe it. But I, my sister there felt the presence of my father who had died 18 months before. My brother-in-law was very moved, my wife. And, and um, this is the most shocking part to me, I tell you the truth. And I'm still wrestling with this. It, I have a number of cases over the years of people who who were there at the bedside of the dying person, who, as the person was dying, empathically co-lived the dying person's life review. Wow. Like people in a near-death experience say they've seen everything they've ever done, you know, in a timeless state, and they witness it from the point of view. But now there's a participant. Now, i got to tell you, this scares me to death. <laughs> I mean, I tell you the truth, I'm hoping to get myself recused from my life review. <laughs> Much less the idea of the spectator was some kind of eating some kind of ghostly popcorn there. <laughs> and and seriously about this, but people say, yeah. And for years I was comforted by my ignorant presupposition that this would have to be somebody who they were. The person was closely connected with, right? It would just make sense. And, and like this woman in Carrollton, Georgia, was remember the look on her faces, talking to me about as her husband had died, they had been together, you know, like childhood friends, literally. And as he was dying, she said she saw his life review around him, and she was participating in it too. And she said they could communicate back and forth about it. And so then, but it was comforting, like I said, to think it has to be somebody remote. But no, some years ago, my wife and I got a communication from an ER doctor who was called to the ER to resuscitate a patient he had never laid eyes on. And, and he said, as this guy was dying, they said that his life review popped up around the doctor. So, you know, I mean, I give up. <laughs> right, I mean, I it's like I can't think my way. <laughs> or a, a wonderful case we talk about too in the book, Proof of Life After Life, just published by Simon Schuster, <laughs> is um, like the home shopping. Network. Yes, this case, this amazing, wonderful guy. I mean, this guy is such a wonderful man. His name is Jeff O'Driscoll, and Jeff is a. I hope you know about this case. It's, he uh, was an emergency room physician, and brought into this ER was a man named Jeff Olson, who owns a uh, graphic arts and advertising agency. He's a fine arts type. And uh, so Jeff was in a car. Jeff Olson was in a car crash, and his wife was killed instantly, and one of his children lived, but the other child was killed in the accident as I recall. So there in the room where Jeff Olson's arm, leg was smashed off, and he was having a near-death experience, and concurrently, Jeff O'Driscoll was coming in there looking at all these tubes and wires. And there amidst them was uh, Jeff Olson's dead wife, <laughs> who had a, 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 an extended conversation with Jeff O'Driscoll. And so, you know, I mean, and I could tell you other things like that from medical doctors. And so, I mean, honestly, I just call me naive and illogical, if you will. <laughs> but I give up. I, I can't think my way out of it. But one of the nurses in the emergency room with Jeff, with both Jeffs, Jeff O'Driscoll, uh, witnessed the same thing as well. Yeah. And 
later on very puzzled she she finally said i saw i saw this and jeff o'driscoll was saying i saw the same thing and subsequently i guess he did talk to jeff olson about it correct oh yeah i've talked to jeff for quite a while over the years and yeah yeah my friend's experience was it actually that's what it reminded me of when i was reading that story um in chapter six you discuss among other things, healings that come from NDEs. And and this friend of mine, several years ago, she was given a number of months to live and put on hospice. She's my age. And after two NDEs and years later, she's cured for the most part and living life like a rock star there you go so (laughs) and when i was messaging her yesterday actually telling her i was going to talk with you and i was so excited and telling her about the book and i'm like and here are the reasons why your experience with a shared death experience like i'm going through the (laughs) the bullet points and everything but how often do you hear of stories like that. I mean, I guess all the time if you're immersed in it. All the time. Thank God. I mean, you know, I am just so grateful, Patrick. That, and, you know, I'm, I keep, I'm not religious. Okay. I'm really not. But to me, it's God is a relationship, right? I mean, I have a relationship with God. Usually, the healings, in my experience, are, are accompanied by a really bright flash of light. It's amazing. Yeah. This light that's not like any other light. A light with substance is how they describe it. And that's usually, in my experience, that's been the case. Is, is it the same with you, Raymond? Or? Yeah, and the, uh, the case I was trying to think about, uh, Anita Marajani, if you know about that. Oh, yeah, Anita, yeah. She was dead. I mean, I mean she, her body was rotting away. And she had this turnaround and talks about this amazing experience. I, you know, I just, I knew this great, uh, oncologist who was kind of, you know, a man of stature, as they say, you know, a very respected and wise oncologist. I guess he was in his early 70s. When, and he was telling me about one day that he had, a, he had a patient who was elderly, had been treating for a long time with the cancer, and then, you know, the patient died. And so there it was covered up with the sheet. And this was, you know, considerable time. And so then the family was gathered around, talking to the doctor and down the hair under the sheet. And uh, there he is. He sits back up, <laughs> has an extended conversation with everybody. And then is back. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the doctor told me, he said, he said, unless all those other people had been standing there, he said, I would have just assuming I would, was having a hallucination. <laughs> so did he talk about did he talk about having any kind of a an experience like you would have with a near death experience? Well, you know, it was just that everybody was amazed that they were talking, you know, fully coherently with a man who had been pronounced dead for quite a while <laughs> and who then just quickly, you know, snapped it off again. And what is that? I mean, I was trying to find that in the pathology book I had in medical school, but no, I, you know, I mean, literally, it gets to a point where it's uh, it's a very similar thing happened with meteorites. Um, Aristotle had said you know, there was even in ancient Greece there were stories of rocks falling from the sky, right? But Aristotle said, well, no, he said rocks. Stones can't fall from the sky because there's no stones up there to fall. And so for a year, I mean, literally centuries, people said, because of Aristotle. All right, and so when cases of uh, meteorite falls occurred, like at Yale, around Prince, or it was Prince, Yale, I think, and somewhere around in the territory, a bolide exploded, and then the pieces fell. And so um, this was 1816, I think, something like that. And so the professors went out there and collected the pieces and wrote a scholarly article about it, which they published in this, you know, what was then, you know, not science as we know it, but, the, you know, the magazines of the scholars. And so Mr. Jefferson, being an eminent man of knowledge and science at the time, they sent him as a referee, right, like they 
sent the paper to him <laughs> for an evaluation. And his reply was, Gentlemen, I had rather believe that those two Yankee professors would lie than believe that stones fell from heaven. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, it, and then there was a spectacular meteor, meteorite fall in France some years later where a bunch of cows were, you know, covered with the boulders and all. And so, you know, finally, well, yeah. But that was good sound principles when Jefferson said it, because Hume had said, you know, distrust testimony, you know. And, and, and so there we are. But it's, I think we're kind of at the meteorite stage now with life after death and near-death experiences. It's, it's just like so many people have had this sort of thing. And the only rear guard action that's going on is people, well, let's try to figure out where in the brain it is. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what about the people standing around? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's harder to... Uh, and so, I mean, I, I've given up. And I think the next step is let's get ready, get get busy reformatting our own minds with new principles of thinking so we can think about these things in a whole new way. I think the chapter that surprised me the most was chapter five on terminal lucidity. Yeah. And this actually came up just a few weeks ago in my interview with nurse Hadley Vlahos on her book, The In-Between. Yeah, right. Because she talks about experiencing these moments too, although I think she calls it the surge of energy. Right. And in your book, you say that terminal lucidity shows objectively that the mind and body sometimes do operate separately. And in doing so, terminal lucidity reveals a great mystery that surely redefines consciousness. Will, uh, will you talk a little bit about terminal lucidity? Well, can I, I throw something in here? It was, it was a, the story he told about the man uh, being dead on the gurney uh -huh. and then coming back to life. That is terminal lucidity. It's a flash of life that takes place shortly before one's death. And it's really, when you see it, you can't help but feel you're seeing something from another world. Um, and and it's, this is something that anybody who works with the terminally ill for long enough and closely enough will be able to say. I mean, and it's, it, it defies words. I mean, it's like they seem to beam with a light, not from the sun or the light bulb, but from inside of them, like this clear light. If they have been demented or or obtundent for a long period of time it's like suddenly they regain sharpness and they can see the people in the room they know who they are they give a message to them and, so on. and then they just sort of and it's go. heartbreaking has to be heartbreaking in in many cases too it is i've seen one but i've actually seen one before it was named it was named Faye, actually which raymond will tell you about in a minute but before it was named terminal lucidity my son was in the hospital with a broken femur, and uh, I would go in every day and spend the day with him. So one day I was in there, and across the hall, they brought a man in who was, uh, he had dementia, and he was sort of at his end stages, and they couldn't, they just wanted him in a hospital. So he was in, he was in the hospital. He was pretty much comatose. And later that night, though, his family came. There were seven people around the bed. He stood up on the bed. And with great lucidity, and he had strength to stand up on a bed, which is something. And he, he went to each one and told them something and talked to them about uh, his life, their life, how much he loved them, about money, things like that. It was a long lecture. He got down, he walked around, and uh, then he went back to bed. And they thought, Eureka, you know, Grandpa's alive, and we're going to take him home. And... I went back to the hospital the next day and his bed was empty and he had passed away during the night. Yeah. And that's the typical pathway of terminal lucidity. Now that it's been named and defined, I think there's going to be a lot more cases talked about. Mm. Because once you name it and define it, the door opens and people say, well, the doctors recognize it, so I'm going to tell my story. And I think that's what will happen. Yeah. Nurse Hadley even told a story about it wasn't in her book, but she said 
she had one of her patients be out on the front lawn um, suddenly with a chainsaw and cutting down a tree. Wow. Oh, my God. And then the next day, gone. <laughs> just this burst of... Yeah, just, just before yeah. they... And it's, it's really startling. As you were saying there, Patrick, it gives the family a, a sort of... They think it means the person is going to get well, but it means that you know, they're going to die. It's a, a medical version of fake news. <laughs> <laughs> so I often wonder with all of the knowledge now that more and more people are having and becoming aware of NDEs and the stories of NDEs, even if they've not had one, I wonder how that affects future NDEs. You know, like, can you plan for an NDE? Or if you are fully prepared and aware of, and I don't know how you can be fully prepared, but if you have a lot more knowledge of them and like less fear of them, maybe, are NDEs going to be more spectacular and more intense as the I world gets to know them? Yes, I predict so. What will happen is the classical objections, Patrick, to the whole question of life after death stem from, for example, David Hume, who was the arch skeptic, 18th century, he's a friend of Ben Franklin to dating, and influenced Einstein. And he said, you know, the logic we have just doesn't work for this question, you know, and that the mind we have isn't adequate. And though that's the facts, really. And so, really, if you're honest about this intellectual honesty, you've got to face what Hume and others said. And, but what I say is that with that facing, yeah, I said that what's going to happen and is happening is that we can reformat our rational mind to overcome the problems that keep people from expressing the experience adequately when they recover. That That when they will come back and say not, there are no words for expressing this, but now I have a new way. It's happened once to a wonderful man um, that I knew is is a uh, eminent scientist and eminent sculptor and just a fine human being who um, took one of my courses on logic and then some years later he he had a near death experience and called me. He was in he H one N one. He was in the hospital for sixty days. Call me shortly out of the get out of the hospital. He'd lost his leg to gangrene. He had three cardiac arrests, but he was telling me about his near death experience. But then he said, uh, "And Raymond," he said, "While I was over there, he said, he's, my mind went back to the seminar, and he said, it's like what you're saying is true that you can't comprehend how there is connected to here.' He said, unless you take the unintelligibility axis into account. But what I'm getting at is, yeah, we can alter our minds in such a way that in the future we can talk about them in a new way, and it's happening, and that will be eventually how this turns out. I think. And uh, so, yeah, in terms of answer your question, yeah, it will it will reshape not not necessarily the near death experience, but it will reshape the way people talk about it. Mm. But also, you know, explaining paranormal experiences, it's it's like that Bertrand Russell story that that was told in Stephen Hawking's book, where Bertrand Russell was giving a, a speech about the cosmos, and. At the end, a woman stood up and she said, you're crazy, Mr. Russell. The earth is flat and it's on the back of a turtle. And he said, oh, really? What holds up the earth in? And she says, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> it's just so difficult to explain. Yeah. Let me out of here. I have, I'm motion sick. Let me off this turtle. <laughs> just, just stop I rocking. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here's this is going to be my favorite part for the last thing. And, you know, I want to talk about the psychomantium oh, and, and mirror gazing. First of all, I've gone back and forth over the years since since reading about this in reunions in your book 
on whether I'm going to empty out a closet here in the house. Yeah. Paint the whole thing black and, you know, create my own psychomantium. And I need for you to please give me a reason to finally do that. And also maybe tell my husband that I'm not crazy for doing it while you're at it. <laughs> okay. Wow. So I went through the same thought process you did. And when he first mentioned this, I was there in Alabama. And, uh, and I just said, Raymond, you're crazy. Yeah, I, I'm crazy. I'll admit. And I wasn't the only one saying it. <laughs> I'm absolutely crazy. However, it, this <laughs> is not because I'm crazy. And uh, this is something I discovered again when I was 18, reading in Herodotus, the Greek book, uh, historian, about these places they had called oracles of the dead, where you could go and you could go through some sort of procedure where you would see and visit with your deceased loved ones. And I remember in my 18-year-old omniscience reading this and just thinking, well, you know, that's, you know, Herodotus was having a bad day. <laughs> you know, I knew that couldn't happen. Well, then... And, but I've always been interested in them because they are very closely associated with the origin of Greek philosophy and therefore of the whole Western way of thinking. Now, flash forward. In the 80s, I read in an archaeological report that this guy had actually found and excavated the most famous one. So based on what they found there, which was the remnants of an enormous bronze cauldron in a subterranean chamber, and on the subterranean chamber's walls were carbon marks from the showing that they had lit it by torchlight down there. Okay, and so then they were all gathered around with and so the archaeologist, a wonderful man, Soterio Stockeris, and and by the way, I'm not trying to correct him because I talked to him years later and I explained my alternate take and he said, oh yeah, I never thought of that. But he, he saw I was right. But basically they had figured that it was just fraud, like that somebody had hid in, hid in the cauldron. They, ha they held him down there for 29 days before they had the vision. So he was figuring it was simple fraud. But I said, no, I knew from other sources that as a psychiatrist, for example, I knew that if you, many people, if they gaze into what's called an optical depth, it can be a silver bowl. They still do this in the Middle East. Silver bowl, highly polished on the inside, filled with olive oil, by candlelight in dark room. And many people under those circumstances see visions. And so I figured, I mean, that's what they were doing. So I set it up and it works. And it's, uh, by the way, and yes, I am crazy, however. A lot of people who are as sane as, as whoever, sane as Trump, you know, have, have done this as well. And, and, you know, it, and, and, it, and the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in, in Palo Alto, uh, years ago, they sent people out to learn how to do this. They, they made it part of their psychotherapy training. And not only that, this is part of the, it's the cultural, heritage of humankind so yeah you can set up a mirror room it's you know you we talk a little bit about how to do it in the book proof of life after life just published by simon and schuster and uh it really works i mean i it's it works so much better patrick than i thought i was using my 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 subjects for the research were my graduate students of psychology and these were people, many of them were already counselors they'd been out to counseling and then you know did came back to do further education and stuff and then as word spread about it a sociology professor and anesthesiologist my my medical colleague uh oh yeah i'd like to try it but we were just doing it out of curiosity will it work so the technique was i would each one was separate you know you can't just do this in an instant right if if grandma comes and it's five o'clock it's i'm sorry it's closing time <laughs> Not, it's not going to work, right? So I would agree. It's like they would come in at 10 o'clock in the morning. We would be there to let, let this whole process unfold. I'd talk to them an hour or two. It's like, what was this person like? You know, what are your fondest memories? What are the trouble spots in the relationship, the unfinished business, that kind of stuff? Then, uh, you know, after that preparation, you 
into this room and you sit in a comfortable chair in a dark room with a little light behind you that you can adjust with the rheostat, I guess, like dimmer switch. And so you just gaze into the mirror and you let yourself go. And, and to my, I would thought it would be, I was thinking if I did 50 cases, I could get maybe five. But um, imagine my astonishment when my first person who was a very well-grounded 44-year-old drug and alcohol rehab counselor. And that is a very earthy group of folks. And she came to see her husband who had died two years before. Imagine her surprise and my surprise when it was her father she showed up instead. And not only did he show up in the mirror, it's not, that he emerged from the mirror and came right in, out into the room and a conversation. And, uh, and so, I mean, it went like that. And, and but I was expecting anybody, they say, oh, yeah, I saw an image in my mirror. It looked like grandma, but was it real or figment? I don't know. That was what I expected. What I heard from my colleagues was, oh, yeah, I saw my grandpa. I mean, this was interpreted as a real event. And as crazy as this sounds, it's been verified by multiple studies by different people who get the same result. And then suddenly Oprah calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Patrick, in turn, you were asking what, what other practical value is that out of this is. Well, in your case, see, creativity. You and I know, as very few people in the world know, that the highest high is creativity. Right, that once you've been in that flow, you just, oh my God, you just, how can I stay there? And I'm running out of marijuana, I can't, you know, and I just, I just made that point. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and I'm serious, I really am, that, you know, it's that flow of creativity is what, well, see, this is an excellent adjunct to that. Because especially is if I suspect you do have, as you drift to sleep at night, what is called hypnagogic experiences. You may hear, see little often surrealistic images or you hear match, snatches of nonsense or you, in your case, probably hear musical interludes of it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if you have that experience, that means, yeah, you would, you would have that. And also, it's not just good for calling up grandma, but uh, it's also excellent for creative creative process. But the, the question is, are these things really real? Do people come out of the mirror and speak to the, the percipient as they say that they do? And actually, there's one case where a woman came over from Argentina and uh, she wanted to see her late daughter. And she was in a big hurry, so she came in. Raymond tried to prep her, but she was a little bit too nervous and edgy. So she spent a couple of hours in the psychomantium and then gave up. She went back to the hotel with her sister. Her sister had come with her. And they were talking about uh, what had transpired. And suddenly, and this was at 3.30 in the afternoon, these three orbs appeared in the room. And they moved around the room like, like giant clear beach balls. And her sister had the wherewithal to photograph them. And one actually came up to the woman, and the woman said that she communicated with her daughter in this orb. And this was later in their hotel room, right? Yeah, yeah and there's several cases like that where people have a failed psychomantium experience, but then they go back to their hotel room, yeah. the lights are out, and it, it all starts up again. They're more relaxed. Yeah. And they will then see they will then see people they'd come to see. And on the camera case, I myself I'm not good at photographs and all that. After nine eleven, I had to stop carrying my camera equipment because the the officer said that that little tray with the powdered magnesium he wouldn't let that through. <laughs> so I, uh, but so I have to leave the camera stuff to to Paul. But it is remarkable, you know, they said, yeah, that their the deceased relative was there in that light. So, Patrick, you want me to send you the orb, a photo of the orb? Absolutely. I would love that. Yeah, I could put it in the show notes. And sometimes, Patrick, the evoker, as I call the person who 
sort of helps the person through. This is what in, in ancient Greece they call them the psychagogues or evokers. They're just there to sort of assist. And it happens that, it ha- that sometimes the person who's assisting sees the apparition too. I have a wonderful friend you would like to know about. His name is Eric Pagani, P-I-G-A-N-I. And I think Eric used to be on uh, PBS as a music consultant, but Eric is childlike, like you and me, Patrick. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he, is the, uh, he is a psychologist and connected with Psychology, which is the, you know, the uh, psychology magazine there in Paris, and also is the psycholog- psychological director of Disneyland Paris, which is being a childhood fan of Walt Disney. But in addition, Eric is best known in France as a wonderful concert pianist. And in 1988, I was in Paris with him, and he was telling about an experience he had had when he was playing a concert. And he said, um, suddenly, as he just said, I lifted out of my body. He was playing a concert on stage. He lifted out of his body. And he was up in a light. And he said, 17 minutes later, he came back to the pen and the, it was over. He was finished. With, and he had played three pieces. And, uh, and so Eric is just this completely sweet and kind-hearted guy. And I asked him, I said, well, did the people at the performance, you know, did they seem to appreciate it? And he was, uh, oh, yes, they, they seemed to. Fortunately, his sister was there and was saying, as a matter of fact, people were jumping up and down and yelling. <laughs> and so Eric said, well, if this has happened to me, it's happened to other people. So having a lot of friends in the operatic business, he interviewed a lot of singers and friends of his, and he got this amazing collection of cases. He had people who had these very spiritual, like out-of-body experiences and experiences of the light while they were playing great music on stage. I've had a lot of meditation kind of experiences uh even growing up i remember my my parents i would listen to so i'm not a lyrics person i'm famously not a lyrics person i could be listening to a song about tacos and something in the harmony and the music just connects and all of a sudden i'll cry or whatever well i would be in my uh bedroom in the corner with a walkman just listening to uh, film score music or or some other song and just all of a sudden intensely crying and my you know parents thinking what is wrong with you stop listening to that music and it was fine i'm just yeah. moved by the music like i've had a lot of experiences like that a lot of creative people must have parents who were troubled by their <laughs> France like states that they lived in for so long. And I, yeah. I guess my parents were really worried about me. <laughs> well, you guys have been so gracious with your time, and I want to give you the opportunity to give me any final thoughts, either of you. And then if there happens to be anyone listening who is hearing about this for the first time or hearing about your work, also, I'd like for you to give them a place where they they can start to get in to this journey. Well, I would like to say to begin, thank you so much for all the folks listening in because, uh, you know, at at seventy nine, I've I don't have any license anymore to be listened to, so that people would you know that you would listen to me is such an a privilege and thank you so much and I you know I just hope that folks have gotten something out of this it's uh, certainly something after 50 years of big you know exploring these experiences it's really a startling thing and I do have a uh, website which is uh, lifeafterlife.com and I'm happy to talk um, to mention my and Paul's new book proof of life after life from uh, Simon and Schuster And again, just honestly to goodness, I'm past the age of politeness. Just thank you folks for listening in. Paul, and thank you. You you rock for being here and and, uh, sharing stories of your friendship and and your experience as well. And I would like to end with uh, notions on belief. 
Instead of starting with disbelief, when you hear something like this, start with belief and then try to shoot it down. Mm -hmm. And you'll come to an entirely different conclusion about what you've heard. Interesting way to look at it. You two rock! Thank you so much! (laughs) Thank you, Patrick. We've had 33 years to practice. (laughs) For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. And you can continue the discussion and hang out with a great community of paranerds by joining us in the Big Seance Parlor on Facebook. Want to hear your voice in a future episode? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. Thank you to the following super paranerds who support this show at patreon.com slash big seance. Jennifer Scanlon, Michael Henson, Daryl, Anne Marie Sullivan, Natalie N., Kim Robb, Josia Lorenzo, and Susan Davey. My supporters at the parlor guest level, who can be found at bigseance.com slash parlor guests, are Ann Rekovich from OzParatech.com, Dina DeCastro of Dina DeCastro Astrology, Janae Michaels from Greyhouse Tarot and Farm Artifacts, Amy Park Gedeke of AmyParkG.com, Lonnie Scott from WeirdWebRadio.com, Lana and John of Carbon Lilies, Midge Munster from MidgeMunster.com, Heather N. of DancingBeeAlchemy.com, Diane Razmataz, Tracy King, Andrew Watson, Amy Taylor, Christine Rath Selhi, Mindy Kentop, Hope Battaglia, Cass and Bailey, Melissa Armour, Janet Shaw Bins, Bruce Williams, and Christopher Kohler. And I currently have four awesome listeners who support this show at the $10 level, which, as you know, isn't even a thing. Those awesome paranerds are Glenna Becker, Steve Skinner, James Wilfong, and Peggy Hagen. Want to know what's even better than the completely made-up $10 level? The completely made-up $20 level. And those awesome peeps are Norman and Linda Keller and Kevin Gilbert. Thank you, paranerds.